All right, we're recording. So welcome everybody to Wednesdays with Linda, the show that is in desperate need of a new name. Um, I'm Linda Shore. I'm the executive director of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And once a month, we look at issues related to learning, teaching, um, and all things related to becoming a better astronomy instructor. So today, I thought we would take a look at a video that really changed the nature of astronomy education in a real significant way in the 80s, which for most of you is probably before you were born. Bah! But for me, um, this film was really important to my career because when I started my work as a doctoral student in education, in large part it was because of this film and I was there during the time that the film was produced and I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, I, was, I was very tangentially um, involved with the film when it was made at Harvard, but I, uh, I know the people well and I know, I know the inside dirt, so to speak. So I see we have um, at least two guests today, Julie and um, it's A-D-E-M-E-R-S, which I assume is an abbreviation of your name, but welcome to both of you and uh, we'll just get started. And uh, Eva is here, she is our moderator, um, and is a member of the staff here at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. All right, so I'm just gonna get started with a PowerPoint and Eva will let me know if it's an issue. And here we go. All right, I'm assuming everybody can see that. So the film we're gonna be talking about is called A Private Universe. And those of you who are in our Astronomy Ambassadors program, you probably saw the film during your training. Um, there may be some of you who are in the museum field who do, um, who do work with the public, perhaps you've seen it. A lot of teachers who are training to be, te future teachers training to be teachers have seen this movie, but many of you haven't. So we will get a chance to actually see the film. I want to take you back to when the film was created in, 19, um, in the 1980s. The film was um, filmed in the mid 80s and finished up in about 1985. So um, this is sort of my youth, but sort of cutting edge technology was the Macintosh computer, which at the time was just a little box and it did things like word processing and you could um, draw, you could do very, very basic, simple things. There was no World Wide Web. There was no internet. There were modems, dial-up modems that you could use to send email to people, but you couldn't get information about anything. Uh, technology on the street was the Walkman. You put a cassette tape in your hip pocket, little player, headphones on your head, and you were out the door. Um, that sort of was the iPhone of the age, I guess, and the Rubik's Cube. And if you don't know what a Rubik's Cube is, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I do want to talk a little bit about education because what classrooms looked like during this period and how teaching, what was state of the art, best practices in teaching in the 80s is really important to know. So people had uh, calculators in their pockets for every science class. It was really important because the majority of class was spent doing problems, doing um, problem sets, calculating things. You're in lab, you needed to be able to do that. The information you received was either directly from the teacher, your book, or film strips, okay? So one thing to keep in mind is if, if you suddenly had a question, like, I wonder where this theory came from, or I wonder what would happen, you know, I, want, I read something somewhere about, um, uh, supernova, I want to get more information. You couldn't access information immediately. It meant taking a bus, going to a library. Maybe they'd have the right book. Maybe they'd have to order a book for you. Maybe you'd have to go to another library. So instantaneous information didn't exist. So it needed to be curated by a teacher, by a book, by a film. The kids you're seeing up in the corner here, um, computer labs meant Typing papers meant um, maybe getting on the internet and doing some email, but again, no instant access to information. So what was the state of, of the art in teaching like? So 
for those of you who don't know, the gentleman here on your left is Paul Hewitt. And Paul Hewitt is still alive, but in his heyday in the 80s, he was one of the best physics lecturers around. And the reason he was so good is he was doing something innovative, which was bringing demonstrations into the classrooms and having students really look carefully at phenomenon, observe, come up with ideas, and then he as a lecturer would kind of mold the class and guide them um, to the right answer, essentially. This was sort of the time when physics lecturers, and I'm, I'm picking on physics because it's easy to pick on. Um, a lot of people were moving away from the dry problem sets on the board to sort of entertainment. So that this other guy here on the right is teaching the physics of surfing and he's, you know, explaining how, how you ride the tube and explaining it via Newtonian mechanics and fluid dynamics and various other things. And the kids are enjoying it, right? But students were still sitting in lectures. It was a stand and deliver kind of pedagogy, um, hands-on, manipulative stuff in your seats. That didn't happen. Um, and again, you, you had to deliver the information to these audiences because there was no other way to deliver it efficiently. There's no internet, no Google, nothing like that. So again, this is actually a classroom, a science classroom, physics again, circa 1980s. Notice they're all boys. Just saying. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things have changed for the good. So before I show you the film, I do want to show you this paper, 1983. And this was right here, this paper was the paper that changed my life personally. Um, I was an astrophysics um, graduate student and I totally expected to be studying galaxies for the rest of my life. And then I read this paper. Um, Scientific American 1983 called Intuitive Physics and Michael McCloskey was talking about interesting experiments he was doing with his high school students to figure out what they knew about physics before they came into a physics class and what he discovered was remarkable and it does lead up to a private universe so we are getting there. One of the questions he asked his physics students, and this was before instruction, during instruction about circular motion, and after, is this question you've probably seen before, which is, you're whirling a marble over your head and it's attached to a string, right? You're whirling it, round and round, constant speed, and right here, you let go. So the question is, what is the subsequent path of the ball? Despite getting A's in their physics classes, it didn't matter. Virtually all the students, even when they got it right, when they could solve the problems on the test, said that it would curve. Now, Newtonian physics says straight line because the force acting on the ball, which is an inward force due to the string, is always changing the speed at a constant rate changing the direction of the speed at a constant rate, changing its direction, but its speed stays the same. So when you cut the string, you take away that inward pull, it'll come out straight. All right, so kids are still thinking this, but when he asked them, why do you think it curves? It's not enough to say, add curves, why do you think that? Here's what they said. They said, the ball maintains a memory of the force. It, it accumulates some memory of it. And when you let go, that memory, that fluid, that whatever it is, slowly dissipates until finally the ball goes in a straight line, but off, you know, off at an angle. What's interesting about this is this identically parallels medieval impetus theory. And medieval impetus theory tried to explain why it was, for example, that when you fired a, um, a projectile, it would take an arc. Okay, we know the answer to that. We've taken physics. We know gravity always pulls downward. The horizontal speed stays the same, and you get this parabola. They didn't know that. So what they thought 
And here is actually a woodcut taken from the Middle Ages explaining impetus theory, is you have a ball and a sling and you whirl it in a circle. And when you let go right here, impetus theory said, it'll curve. And it curves because an object with a force acting on it builds up impetus some magic fluid called impetus that dissipates pretty rapidly when you stop pushing and the object will go on its merry way for a little while and then go straight again. So he said, huh, this is interesting. The kids seem to have the same ideas as medieval scientists had. So he probed some more. So this is John Fel I can never pronounce his name. This is impetus theory of the sixth century. Philipponus, John Philipponus. So this comes from the sixth century and here's the javelin throw. It's the Olympics right now, so it's important to talk about the javelin. So the question he asked is, why does a javelin continue to move after it leaves the hand of the athlete? What makes it go? Why doesn't it just, as soon as he lets go, it should just, boom, fall to the floor. Why does it keep going? So he said it's because of impetus theory, that the arm of this javelin thrower is exerting a force, exerting a force, exerting a force, and at the instant the javelin thrower lets go, it maintains some of this impetus and continues to go. It sounds so sensible, right? It's so intuitive. It sounds so logical in some sort of way, right? Well, it also, these kids in McCloskey's class used impetus theory for a lot of things. Here is a ball held passively, just passively in this person's hand. They're not going to push, they're just carrying. But they're going to be walking at a constant speed. And at some point, they're just going to let go of the ball. Just drop it. So medieval impetus theory predicts that if you're not pushing it, nobody's pushing this ball, you're just passively carrying it. So when you open your fingers and let go, it should fall straight down immediately. There's no memory of force going on here. So as this man moves forward, the ball will sort of be left behind. And all the students in his class predicted that would happen. When in reality, there is a force acting on the ball. It's the downward force of gravity, always acting down. But when you passively let go, you've had a constant speed this whole time. And this ball gets that constant speed and you should get a parabola and it will fall at your feet. So in your frame of reference, it falls to your feet. In my frame of reference, watching the man, I get a curve. That is not a very intuitive idea. That, that idea would not come to a medieval scientist's head immediately, nor would it come to the idea of a kid. So impetus theory kind of makes sense. It's not correct, but it makes sense. It makes logical sense. And that's what this paper is all about. And I encourage you to read it. I have a link in the PowerPoint to take you there if you want to read the paper. It'll change your life. You're all going to become cognitive scientists the way I did, because <laughs> I wanted to understand this. But in the 80s, and in these physics classes, there turned out to be a very close parallel between the beliefs of medieval scientists and the beliefs that these kids had about physics. They had Aristotelian ideas about motion. They had Aristotelian ideas about astronomy. They had medieval ideas about force and motion. Because they make sense. They're intuitive. They're not right, but they make some sense. So here's a quote from McCloskey's paper. And this was what got me into, into the field of cognitive science. He asks the question, how can such misconceptions be dispelled? The obvious answer is through normal instruction in Newtonian mechanics. Just teach him the right answer, right? But studies by several investigators, including himself, suggest that the intuitive ideas are difficult to modify. They're actually kind of impossible. Although some students who take physics um, courses achieve a firm grasp of Newtonian mechanics, many emerge with their intuitive impetus theories intact. Well, this intrigued me. I, nobody had really ever probed what students were thinking before, during, and after their physics classes. And to discover that their ideas mirrored medieval science fascinated me. 
And so I decided I wanted to do the same type of research, but in astronomy. Was it also true in astronomy? So what are some examples of similar private theories in astronomy? We're going to find out. So this is where this film comes, comes in. So in, the, in about 1984, the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics started, um, there was an education department that started there. It was started by Phil Sadler, who's still there. And he was very interested in doing similar work in astronomy to figure out what high school students knew. What did they believe? Did they believe Aristotelian ideas? And so I'm going to play this movie for you. Keep in mind, you're looking at 1984. Um, and uh, Eva, who's also from Boston, Eva and I will enjoy the Boston accents because they're always fun to listen to. <laughs> so enjoy the movie. And when it's finished, um, we'll talk a bit. So let's hope uh, the audio works. And Eva, you'll nod. You can see the film. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg Media. Um, film's not up. Film's not up? No, just audio. Okay. I think I know what it is. Hang on. Hang on. Share the screen. Aha. All right. Let's try it. Now you've got it. Excellent. You can hear it okay? Despite a lifetime of the very best education, students in our classrooms are failing to learn science. Many of these students will graduate from college with the same scientific misconceptions that they had on entering grade school. To test how a lifetime of education affects our understanding of science, we ask these recent graduates some simple questions in astronomy. Consider, for example, that the causes of the seasons is a topic taught in every standard curriculum. Okay, I think the seasons happens because as the Earth travels around the sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather, and, then, and hence the seasons. How hot it is or how cold it is at any given time of the year has to do with the, the, the closeness of the Earth to the sun during the seasonal periods. The Earth goes around the sun, <laughs> and, and it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun, and it gets colder when we get farther away from the sun. These graduates, like many of us, Think of the Earth's orbit as a highly exaggerated ellipse. Even though the Earth's orbit is very nearly circular, with distance producing virtually no effect on the seasons, we carry with us the strong, incorrect belief that changing distance is responsible for the seasons. I took uh, physics, planetary motion, and relativity, and electromagnetism, and waves. I've never really had a scientific background whatsoever, and I, and I got through school without having it. I've gotten very far without having it. I had uh, a, quite a bit of science in high school, yeah, uh, through uh, physics, one, first year and two years of chemistry. Regardless of their science education, 21 of the 23 randomly selected students, faculty, and alumni of Harvard University revealed misconceptions when asked to explain either the seasons or the phases of the moon. When it's further away from um, the sun, then it gets colder. The Earth's position interferes with the reflection of the sun against the moon. Class of 1924. Class of 1925. To test how standard instruction succeeds or fails in reversing such misconceptions, we interviewed ninth grade students from a nearby high school. The students selected had little training in astronomy. When it's winter, it's when the sun is furthest away from the Earth. And when it's um, summer, it's when the sun's closer to the Earth. But why is it hotter, say, in the summer than the winter? It's hotter in the summer because we're closer to the sun. 
Tell me, uh, Tell me about the different shapes of the moon. Of the moon? When the sun's right here, the earth blocks the sun rays and it causes the moon to have a shadow right here. So that the monthly the cycle of lunar phases is caused by the shadow of the earth is another popular misconception. Can you tell me about the difference in seasons? What's different about different seasons of the year? In the summertime, it's like we're closer to the sun and the sun's um, rays are coming down so it's hot. And in the winter, you move further away, I guess, and it gets colder. Unlike the Harvard graduates, these students have had virtually no instruction in science. And does the moon have different shapes? Or? No, it's round. It's round. Does it ever look different than round? Yeah, it does. It it's, looks like a half cr crescent. It can look like a half. Mm -hmm. And what causes that? Um, clouds blocking it. Like, say you had a half moon. This is here with clouds. And all you see is the half moon. Like a scientist in search of an explanation, this student created his own unique theory to explain the phases. I don't know. I don't know what you you get some kind of key in a worm theory as to why kids don't understand it all. If if we went outside today and out in the grass here, we'd see the sun up above. Mm -hmm. uh, what would what would things look like, um, uh, say at eight o'clock? At eight o'clock, this um the sun would have rotated. Well, the Earth would have rotated so that the sun would be on the other side of the Earth, so then it would be dark here and we'd be able to see the other stars. Or the, yeah. Okay. And where would the stars be in the daytime? They're still out there, we just can't see them because it's not dark enough. Heather. Heather's very bright. On a scale of one to ten, maybe I would probably put her at the nine, a little bit above the, the level of the other kids. And I would expect her to know the answers to these things. That's the sun, although mm -hmm. it's a lot bigger. And then um, there's a planet and another planet, and then there's the Earth, because it's the third planet out from the sun. And then there are six more planets. And, okay, the Earth revolves around the sun. The moon revolves around the Earth. So this goes like this, and that goes like that. And each time the Earth goes like this is a day. And it takes 300, and I'm going to get it confused, 365 days for the Earth to go all the way around the sun, and that's a year. You may recognize Heather as typical of your best student. Yeah, I would expect that, that she can give a, a better explanation than the other kids could. I think she has a little bit... And she's a lot more sure of herself. The other kids, I think, might have been a little bit inhibited and were afraid. And I hope she'll tell you what she knows. But the Earth doesn't quite go in a circle. It's more of, let's see, it's more like sort of like that, I think. On probing, we see that Heather believes that the Earth travels in a bizarre curlicue orbit. And when it's farther away, it's summer. When it's closer right here, it's winter. Okay, it's winter when it's closer and it's summer when it's farther away because of, um, well, at least for us it is, because, when, because of this axis. When the sun's rays are indirect, it's summer because we get warmer. When the earth is closer, the, beam, the sunbeams are direct and it's colder. Could you draw a picture of what you mean by direct and indirect? Okay. Well, when the light comes from the sun, when it's direct, it comes straight from the sun to the earth, I think. And when the light's indirect, it sort of bounces off and then comes to the northern hemisphere. It's different. Heather believes that light can bounce and that this somehow causes the seasons. When it bounces off and then comes, you know, when it sort of well, when it doesn't go in a straight line, I guess, it's warmer. It's confusing. What about the moon? What does the moon look like? Oh, this is, this is mind boggling though. The moon has like four cycles. And so sometimes it's full. Sometimes you can only see part of it. Sometimes you just can't see it at all. And other times you can only see this part of it. That's a come that sometimes looks like a sickle. Could you draw me a picture of how that happens? 
Well, this is us over here. And then we can see the moon and the rays from the sun sort of come around and they only illuminate part of the, you know, part of the um, moon because I guess it's the Earth's shadow or something. Heather's private theories contradict the teachings of even the most elementary science courses. You assume that they know certain things and even the day that I taught it, I come in and I just assume that they had the basic ideas and they don't. Heather's teacher was unaware of the students' private theories as she taught them the first formal lesson in astronomy. Going through changes. Let's see what's going on with the film. You're the only ones that have changes. You ever hear that about the moon? Yeah, maybe the phases pull it back to, to the nine yeah. minute mark. Yeah. The phases of the moon. It goes through different stages. Oh, oh something. Sorry about that. Let's get it back. Yeah. I may have to call it up again, which isn't hard. Looks like I've got the spinning wheel of death. It, it might be an issue on the, their websites. And. Eh. All right, let me, uh, we're going to restart it. Hang on. No problem. Come on. All right, do it the old fashioned way. I'm just gonna move it forward. Seeing the film again? Looks good, sounds good. Okay. Part of the, you know, part of there the you go. Um, moon because I guess it's the Earth's shadow or something. Heather's private theories contradict the teachings of even the most elementary science courses. You assume that they know certain things and even the day that I taught it, I come in and I just assume that they had the basic ideas and they don't. Heather's teacher was unaware of the students' private theories as she taught them their first formal lesson in astronomy. Going through changes. Are we the only ones that have changes? You ever hear that about the moon, the phases of the moon? What does that mean, Jean? The phases of the moon. It goes through different stages. Oh, something blocks it? Yeah, it's like clouds block it. You can explain all that to me. Clouds block it? You mean when there are no clouds, that, that it's always full? How about when it's like this? You see that? No. Now, where are we? On the dark side. We're here. So when I look up into the sky, what do I see? Nothing. Nothing. You're not going to see anything. The moon is still there, but there's no light being shown on that side that I can see. Any Would anybody show? James, do you want to show us? You were showing us earlier? Yeah, what? Could you explain to me why the, the moon has phases and why we see, you know, different things at different times? Can everybody what see? You John, you have a question? Yeah. Well, like a... Half moon, so no. A quarter of a half moon is a crescent? Well, Why is it called a crescent? It's shaped like a shape like crescent. It's curved. It's shaped like, you know those crescent rolls, yeah, right? It's soft. It's soft. No, not quite. Well, yeah, actually, I suppose it's all the same. Okay, James, thanks. Okay, does the moon have any light of its own? The, no. Where does it get its light? It gets life from the um, rays that bounce off the... Sun. What's if another you, word for bounce off? Um, reflect. Reflect, okay. Like, like if you're on the moon, you could see the lights bouncing off the earth. Okay. You know, yeah, yeah. there's America, and it's nighttime right now. And um, you'd see a half moon right now, because the sun, the, the, the way the moon's facing the sun, shaped like that. So the moon doesn't actually change shape? No. It just, just, just the way the sun hits it. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. John Dixon, did you get that? Yeah. Everybody see that? We interviewed Heather again two weeks after the lesson to see how her private theories were modified by teaching. What I got confused about was um, if the sun's here, what does the path look like when, you know, that the earth takes? 
And I wasn't sure whether it sort of went like this. Or, whoops. But then we figured out that it sort of went like that. Hmm. <laughs> I'm surprised that she remembered the exact picture she had drawn. I mean, she didn't even hesitate. It was like, right, like this. And, and when we saw it originally, to me, it seemed like such a crazy thing. I mean, that really was her idea of it. It wasn't just, well, maybe it'll be like this. I mean, that really was her idea of how it orbited. First idea you had about this curly cues. Where did you, oh, get, where did you get that idea? I have that? no idea. It was probably because I was looking in my Earth science book in eighth grade, and I looked at another chart and got it confused with this one. In class, Heather was able to reverse the misconceptions she had pieced together on her own from books and other sources. So, this one's wrong. But just as often, misconceptions can originate in the classroom. For example, the notion that the seasons are caused by the highly elliptical orbit of the Earth is a misconception which results from perspective drawings found in many textbooks. Let's see how instruction has altered Heather's other yeah. theories, such um, as the one she holds about the phases of the moon. The sun, and then here's the Earth, and the moon's turning around it in intricate little circles. So as the um, moon goes around the Earth, um, at different points in time, the sun illuminates different parts of the moon. And um, as it goes around, people on Earth can see different phases of the moon. Um, you know, the full moon, the crescent moon, the new moon. Heather appears able to recreate the teacher's explanation perfectly. What did you, what, and what did you learn in class and what did you know in the moon? In this, in the um, other, in ninth grade class when you came to videotape? That's right. Um, well, we learned the phases of the moon, although we didn't learn where the moon was at those times. So I don't remember learning that. So that makes it sort of hard because you know what the phases are, but you don't know where the moon was. I mean, the moon could be over here, it 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 could be, you know, practically anywhere on its orbit around. But she still has some lingering doubts, and when pressed, shows that she still holds on to her private theory about the shadow of the Earth. I'm almost sure that a lunar eclipse is when the shadow of the Earth is over the moon so we can't see it. But I'm not sure about the new moon and the full moon. Whether it's, you know, what's in, whether it's that the, um, whether it's that the, it's because the moon's right in front of the sun, so that the back's getting the light and we can't see the light, or whether it's because over here, you know, over here's the new moon because of the shadow. But I think it's over here's the full moon. Yeah, that would make sense, because if it was just, yeah, I think over here's the new moon and over here. Here, no, over here's the full moon, and over here's the new moon. I'm almost positive about that. Almost, ha. <laughs> when did you come to understand that? Well, if if this was the new moon, then a lunar eclipse would be so special because that would be that would mean that the shadow would all you know would once a month be shutting out the light of the moon, or you know the lights that bounce off to the moon. Um. And so, as it, so then a lunar eclipse wouldn't be so special anymore. You know, it wouldn't be a big thing. It would just be a lunar, you know, it would be um, called a new moon. If Heather hadn't been forced to confront her private theory, she might never have learned the correct explanation. But I also know that what happened was that she had to hold the things in her hands. I mean, you didn't even, uh, whoever was filming her, didn't say, use these to show it. You said, how did that happen? And she immediately took them and started working with them and, and figuring it out. Um, and I think too often that doesn't happen with kids, that they don't get to see, the, to see it exactly in their hands and feel it. We then asked Heather about the seasons and her theory of bouncing light. Because the earth is tilted and the sun is right here, this would be... Let's see, this is the northern hemisphere, so then we would be having summer. Like that, because the rays would go like that. And down here, they would have winter. And on the equator, it would be summer, because it's summer all, you know, all year long, because they get pretty much direct rays. But when, let's see, when it's over here, because this part of the Earth is showing towards the sun, that gets the direct rays, and that means they're having summer down here and winter up here. Again, Heather gave a perfectly acceptable explanation for the seasons. But then, oh. 
we asked her to define the terms direct and indirect. Direct rays are rays coming directly from the sun. Um, indirect rays are when they come from the sun and then bounce off another object. She sort of does like not let go of her theory of bouncing light. Sort of like if they bounced off a mirror. If you had a light bulb here, a mirror here, and if you twisted a light bulb so it was like that, light would bounce off the mirror somewhere else. And um, so if you had a mirror here and a light here, the light would bounce. And here we would have winter, I guess because it would sort of bounce or something. I don't know where she picked that up. Somewhere along the line she did, and she just doesn't want to let go of it. Since Heather's misconceptions were not directly addressed in the class lesson, we tried to alter her inappropriate definition of direct and indirect light through one-on-one -on -one instruction. Notice how she tries to blend these new concepts into her old. This here and the, and the sun's rays are going directly to the northern hemisphere. That would be summer. Because like, you know, the rays would be stronger both because they weren't getting interrupted for anything and because the rays of the sun would be closer together. Like shown right here. And when, it's, when the northern hemisphere is farther away, it would be winter up here because the, um, the rays from the sun would be hitting at a slant and it would sort of bounce off. And Notice how she tries to blend these new concepts into her old. This here and the, and the sun's rays are going directly to the northern hemisphere. That would be summer. Because like, you know, the rays would be stronger, both because they weren't getting interrupted for anything and because the rays of the sun would be closer together. Like shown right here. And when it's, when the northern hemisphere is farther away, it would be winter up here because the, um, the rays from the sun would be hitting at a slant and it would sort of bounce off other parts of the earth. Her own personal theory is so deeply ingrained that despite our attempts, she never abandons it. I guess you have to realize that kids really do have the ideas coming in and you think it's, that it's like a void, but it's not. They have, they have experiences and they have ideas that they associate with other things. And until you kind of straightened out those initial ideas, it kind of closes off their minds to what it is you're trying to get across to them, really. That's 23.5 degrees. That's the angle of the tilt. <coughs> it's not that much. It's not that much, but it's enough to give us the four seasons. Every time we communicate, new concepts compete with the preconceived ideas of our listeners. All students hold these ideas but they are unaware of their private theories. The ocean under the moon has... Because it spins the, the sun, the spot on the earth where the sun is moves. Do you think they are in terms of the, uh, the rotation that we make? We must make them aware. Only then can we enable them to learn and free them from this private universe. Okay, you guys can hear me? Yes, Eva says yes. Okay, so that was a private universe and um, I'm looking up at the time and I'm, I can talk about this for an hour and people have taken this film and dissected it and you know, it's easy to do a whole three hours on just this film alone, but you know, if I were gonna summarize the, the main points of it, just in the interest of time, um, there are many points, but if I were to summarize it, I would say the notion that um, people come into your classroom not as empty slates, but filled with all kinds of ideas they've picked up either from the media or by their own logical, you know, uh, deductions about the world around them. They are coming in with pretty rich ideas of what's going on. We should stop sharing this a second. Um, the second thing is that just lecturing the way I'm doing right now is not particularly effective against, you know, these ideas that are so firmly entrenched. Um, people really do need lots of hands-on experiences, 
lots of opportunities to face contradictory ideas or contradictory evidence so that they they change their ideas because the evidence is so strong um, against what they're thinking and towards something else. Um, and the teachers, as they teach, as you do your outreach or as you work with the public, you always have to keep in mind and probe what your audience is thinking. And there are ways to do it in, in very non sort of teachy ways. You know, you don't have to pass out quizzes and collect them or anything like that. But you can constantly probe and check and see how your, how your audience is doing and, and how their concepts are, are being shaped. Um, are there any comments from any of our viewers? And you can type them into the chat if you want, and Eva will read it. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll just uh, show you a few other things. Oops. Go back to the PowerPoint. No? Not looking like a lot of questions or comments okay. coming in. All right. Let me just uh, plow ahead then for a moment. I'm going to share the screen again, and you're going to look back at the PowerPoint, hopefully. And here we go. Eva's nodding, so it must be okay. Um, I'm going to really skip through some of these. Um, one thing that people get very confused about is when is a th an idea of somebody, a private theory, something that's really deeply ingrained, and when is it just a wrong answer? Because sometimes you're just wrong. So let's take a look at Pluto for a moment. Um, somebody might say Pluto has no moons, or Pluto is always farther from the Earth than Neptune is, or we just landed the New Horizons spacecraft on Pluto. Those are all wrong but they're not, they don't reach the level of deeply held beliefs. You know, it's not, Pluto has no moons can be easily addressed by saying, well, actually they used to think that, but they're actually, well, now what are we up to? We're up to at least two, if not three. Um, Pluto is always farther from the earth than Neptune. That's just a matter of not knowing that the orbits cross, that we landed new horizons on Pluto. That's not a misconception, that's a misunderstanding. Here's where it becomes a misconception. And I don't like even using that word because it, it implies that somebody has, has made some sort of horrible mistake. Oh, did I just freeze? Let's go on to the next, uh, oops. You're frozen, but this, this, are you moving the slide? Yeah, did it go to the next slide? No. Not yet? Me, 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 me. Well, I will just talk and you can just stare at this. <laughs> so when I did research on astronomy misconceptions, oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. So these aren't private theories, they're just wrong answers. So this was some research that I did and I interviewed several, I, I surveyed and interviewed several thousand people and it didn't matter how old you were, it didn't matter whether you had taken science or not or taken astronomy. About 50% of the people I surveyed thought that the stars were tiny points of light scattered between the Earth and Pluto. That rises not to the level of a misunderstanding or just a, a lack of not knowing facts. This, be, this is really a belief, and it's based on observation. You look up at the sky, you see tiny points of light. Those are called the stars. They don't look very big. They look kind of close. And you're told every single day that Pluto is really far, it's far away, it's so far away, you can't see it in the sky, that's how far away it is. And when you're told that over and over again and, the, and you see the stars as being very close, you in fact have an idea that matches, again, medieval science, that this is a woodcut from um, the late Middle Ages showing um, a man poking through the vault of the sky, poking through the dome that contains all the tiny points of light, um, and that dome contains the sun, and it contains the moon, and it's the earth in the middle. But when you puncture through that, you see the gears that make the universe go, the mysterious mechanism of the universe that will always be um, hidden by this big dome of the sky. While it may sound crazy, it sure is intuitive. You look up, and, and that's what you see. And so it's not surprising that 50% that or 
up to 60% in some cases of the people I talked to, even if they took astronomy, even if they said, yeah, well, I studied about suns and about nucleosynthesis and I studied all that, but the stars are tiny points of light scattered between the Earth and Pluto. Um, you can hold those two ideas together. One of them is um, very highly intuitive and ingrained in your beliefs, and I'm getting the two minute warning. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot to say, but um, here's a slide just showing you very quickly some wrong answers that can be easily fixed and some private theories. Um, and the private theories, again, are all, all mirror the science of the Middle Ages in many ways. Um, the far side of the moon, that other side is perpetually in darkness and never gets light from the sun, um, which of course isn't true. It gets as much sunlight as the near side does. Uh, the moon's phases are caused by the Earth's shadow. That's a misconception from thinking the Earth and sun are very, Earth and moon are very close together because if they're super close together, closer than they really are, you're always in the sun shadow. How would you miss it? So people can pause this later. I'm gonna skip quickly to this last slide. And I can always talk more, I can talk on and on about this movie and I apologize, I didn't leave enough time for a discussion, but maybe we can do that another time. Um, if you wanna see- Also, we, we also welcome discussion on the message boards on AFCU. So anything that you may want to ask, um, we will be checking that and we can either answer in there or perhaps in a later video. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I have a link here to a private universe and not only is the film there, but they did subsequent films, some wonderful ones on um, biology. One of my favorites is they went to MIT and to the electrical engineering program and gave these advanced electrical engineering majors light bulbs and wires and batteries to see if they knew how to light a light bulb and they didn't, which says something interesting about engineering education. Um, there is the link to the article on intuitive physics and there's also, I was gonna talk a little bit about Piaget, you are in luck, didn't have time. <laughs> so you can read about, um, th read about the idea that private theories are actually an old idea. They originate from, of, uh, with Piaget in the 1920s. Um, what we're gonna do next time, or, or another time, is I'm glad to do sort of a part two and uh, this, this particular PowerPoint and presentation will be archived and you can tell your friends to go see this and then we'll do part two and we'll do an open-ended discussion of a private universe and uh, all the different things it teaches us about best practices in astronomy education. And here I, here I yammered the entire time. Next time we're gonna do hands-on activities. We're gonna do some activities on magnetism and so I'll ask you to bring some, some gizmos with you that are easy to find and we can experiment with magnetism. Any questions out there? Comments? Julie has a question. She says, I've heard the misconceptions um, and read a few articles, but um, how can you uh, take into account in your teaching um, how do you take them into account? Basically? How do you take them into account? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there are ways while you lecture that you can probe for misconceptions. I'll give you a really quick one and then maybe we'll, we'll do this on another day as well. Um, you can take, let me see if I have something in my pocket. You can take two objects, one representing the earth and one representing the moon to scale. And you can say, all right, I'm gonna separate them. And when you think they're the right distance apart, raise your hand and keep your hand up. And when you see half the hands in the air, it means half the people in the room think it's, they're further away and half think they're closer together. You're probably gonna get a distance about like this, about three to five Earth diameters, Earth lined up in a row, give you the distance between the Earth and the moon. It's 30 Earths 
laid end to end. And what you can do is you probe the audience to get a general sense of where they are. Then you can do an exper do an activity and you can come back to it and say, okay, let's try it again. Now what do you think? And that gives you a very, not only a quick way of gauging how your audience is doing, but it has them reflect on their own knowledge and their own learning. And watching other people around you with their answers too allows for discussion, argument. And so there are lots of different ways you can embed um, preconceptions quizzes into your lecture or into your teaching as, as a way for you, the teacher, to change what you do. If I look around the room and I see everybody's got the right answer, I can move along. If I look around and I see everybody's gotten it wrong, whoa, I got to stop. I can't, I should really d address this before I move on. So we can do a whole 40-minute um, session just on those little probes and to give you an idea of how to use them. It's a great question. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us. Yeah, and I apologize, it's a short session for a big topic like this, but, but we'll go into it some more. And please let us know if there's certain topics you'd like us to do, we'd be happy to do it. Okay. Goodbye from Galactic Headquarters of the ASP. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>